continuum. Even though I can tell you, yes, with experience, generally eight and nine year olds should be able to do this. And generally 10 and 11 year olds should be able to do this. But we also know that children don't always start at the same time back here when they're five and do everything in sequential order. Sometimes they don't come to you until they're in fifth grade, right? So keep in mind that this continuum that we're talking about, while yes, we could tie it to chronological age, it's not um, indicated only by chronological age because it has to do with experience and preparation that, that has to happen for these steps to occur. So just keep that in mind. Um, that, if they, that we have to lay down the foundational skills in, in relatively sequential order for them to arrive at the goal. We have to present these early steps early and often. We have to give them opportunities to, to try some of these things that we're going to discuss early in their career as a singer and as often as possible to let those things settle in a little bit. And we have to be methodical about the way that we do it. It has to be well planned because the sequencing in this particular um, instance is very important. So with all that said, let me also say don't rush. Don't rush children to the end goal of singing in multiple parts two different lines that are functioning at the same time. Don't miss the beauty and the value of unison. And I'll go ahead and admit this is a big step box. I mean, step box, and I'm going to step up on it for a minute. Singing in unison is foundational in the sense that it's where we start, but it is anything from being simple. It is anything but elementary in the sense of basic. Okay, yes, it is, it is elementary in that we start here, but to sing well in unison requires a great deal of effort, and it requires a great deal of skill. And actually, I have all of my choirs, regardless of age and regardless of level, sing in unison, in unison more than once in any given year, because I think it's that important. Uh, so keep that in mind, that in the amount of time that you have with your children, if what you can do is teach them to sing beautifully in unison, that is not a small thing, all right? And I know that. So just keep that in your mind, even as we're looking at this continuum of moving them towards independence. But we do know that we do eventually want them to leave junior choir, or whatever your, your cherubs are called, whatever your, your little babies are called. We want them to move into a youth choir, where parts naturally have to happen because voices are starting to change, right? And we want them to continue singing as adults. So we need to prepare them for this experience, but don't overlook the, the possibilities, musically and otherwise, that you have with unison singing. All right, so now let's look, and I think you have a handout that has this list on that handout for your reference. Let's look at the steps that we're going to talk about, and then we'll go back and, and discuss each one. We'll talk about echo, chain phrases, call and response, obstinati, partner songs, canons, counter melodies, two-part songs, and vocal recording. Right, that's going to be our continuum, and I would argue basically in that order. You might make an argument for here and there for a flip every once in a while, but for the most part, that's the order that we need to be working in um, as we move children towards independence. So now let's go back and talk just a minute about echoing. It's probably the most basic. You've done this before. Antiphonal singing might be echo, we just did a little antiphonal singing in here a few minutes ago that was not echo, it was actually call and response. But it might be that you split your choir in half and line them up over here and one group sings and the other group echoes it exactly, right? <laughs> and to me, learn about antiphonal singing and just the fact that you've done that makes it very, very advanced stuff. But actually, all we're doing is echoing, all right? So an echo is an exact repeat. Exactly like we just did a lot 
for this purpose. Um, something else that that tells me is who is matching pitch or who is having a problem with that process. I'm getting all kinds of input in where all you're worried about is echoing me exactly. Another way that I do that is a little cushy ball, something like this. It's really fun to touch, and they get to hold it, and they get to do this. You want to de germ it on a regular basis. Um, but it's a lot of fun. And I thought, in, in, choir, in my room, you have you can opt out. If you don't want to echo me that day, you just toss me back the ball, and we move on. It is not a big deal. All right, so you may find the same freedom. If you would like to sing back to me and echo me, you may. And if you would like to smile at me, please smile at me. And throw me the ball back, that would be okay, too. Okay? So if I toss it to you and you don't want to do it, do not sing. But this is how I use this with my very youngest children who are just starting into the process of echoing. And we do, Yoo I'm going to do Miss Teresa because I know her name. And you don't have to sing. Okay. Yoo Teresa. And she'll sing. Is that familiar? 
Let's sing hot cross buns. Hot cross buns, hot cross buns. One a penny, two a penny, hot cross buns. Do it one more time because a few people were not sure about their hot cross buns. Here we go. Yeah. Hot cross buns, hot cross buns. One a penny, two a penny, hot cross buns. Very nice. Now we're going to do it in sections. All right, so let's have, let's so I can make it kind of even. Let's do one right here, two, three, four. All right, we'll let you start. So this group's going to sing the first line. This group's going to sing the second line. This group's going to sing the third line of the song. And this group's going to sing the fourth line of the song. We've just created a chain of phrases. You get it? That's how it works. All right, here we go. Ready, sing. Hot cross buns, hot cross buns. One a penny, two a penny, hot cross buns. This is really fun. If you have a small-ish group, I would say 15, 17, 20, this would work really well. And we line up, uh, my children at, in kindergarten, first grade, are sitting in a circle. And for, for this particular purpose, I would stand them up and we would square that circle off. So we'd have a square that obviously has four sides, right? And then I stand in the middle of that square with my microphone and I do this. And each, each group gets to sing one phrase. And then I change where I start because that's going to change what they sing. Right? So how is that moving towards independence? Think about that for a minute. What are they having to think? they got to know what their part is. What else are they having to think about? When. When. What's happening before I sing? What's happening after I sing? Could I sing somebody else's line? Their brains are engaged constantly because more than likely they're singing with those other groups as well in their brains, tonal memory. Right? All kinds of things happening with that. But chain phrases are a really nice way to get you thinking about one particular element or one particular passage. And then obviously from there, if, if your children are, are, are um, ready for this or, or like to do this, you take individuals. And the individuals <coughs> sing those chains, sing those phrases. <coughs> so chain phrases, the next stop along the path. I would say any simple, short melody that your children know would work really well for this. Something that would that you might eventually sing as a round or it's written to be a round, that kind of thing works really well for chain phrases. One other um, related idea is to do this as a pitch matching um, exercise as well. Do you know the little spiritual? It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. I feel pretty sure I stole this from John Harmon. I think that's where this came from. But I love it because then you go, it's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. And I make a note right there, right? This child didn't quite match where that pitch was. So the net, you know, we just kind of see how many times we need to do that to pull everybody up to where that, that pitch needs to be. So that works really, really well. Also, I left the title off this list back here. Do you know A Love Round by Nancy Gifford? Nice little piece, just came out a little while ago. Let me write it up here so I don't forget it. It works extremely well as chain phrases. And what I did with this just this spring, it is actually printed on the paper as a round, and we'll get to those later on. My kindergarten first graders are not ready for a round, but they can do chain phrases. So we learned it as a unison melody. Um, love, love with hand motions. Love, 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 love. Christian, this is your call to love your neighbor as yourself, for God loves us all. We learned it in unison, then we did it as a chain phrase, and then we did it as individuals. And then later, when we sang that for the parents, we had a sharing service at the end of the year. The, the youngest children introduced it, unison, chain phrases, and then the older children sang it around. And so they were able to see this progression that we're talking about right this minute. So a love round is a great little piece for this process. Okay, so far so good? Yeah? All right. Call and response. This is probably one that's familiar in, in label anyway. Um, with a call and response form, you literally have one group or one person who gives the call, who gives the, the musical question. 
right, in, in um, actual terminology. And then you have the group that gives the answer, that gives the response, that gives the consequences, the antecedent and the consequence. That's what's going on there. So call <coughs> and response. Now, as a teacher, you need to make sure that you realize that those responses might do one of two things. They might be exactly the same every time, regardless of the call, or they might change. Okay? And that's important to know because you don't want to get into the process of teaching the response and then go, oh, this is not the same. And then you're in that with the kid and going, no, this way, no, this way, no, this way. Right? That's kind of a tricky thing, so we'll talk about that. All right, so call and response. The response remains the same and the call changes. Or the response changes slightly after each call. Now, those two things are interrelated, but they're not necessarily related to each other. The call might change every time and the response remains the same, or the call might change, and the response is changing. So you have different moving parts here. So this makes us a little step up in terms of independence. Let's do one that is a constant response. So this is your part. Stand up tall, because your body's need to move a little bit. A float, I don't want you to float on into oblivion. Here's your part. Oh yes, try it. Oh yes. And it needs a lot of emphatic Drama. Ready? Oh, yes. Oh, John the Rabbit. Oh, yes. Oh, John the Rabbit. Oh, yes. And a mighty bad habit. Oh, yes. Of going to my garden. Oh, yes. And eating up my peas. Oh, yes. And cutting down my cabbage. Oh, yes. We like tomatoes. Oh, yes. And sweet potatoes. Oh, yes. And if I live. Oh, yes. Oh yes, then I won't plant. Oh yes, a garden at all. Oh yes, very nicely done. <laughs> very silly, very fun. Nice pitch matching if you only have one, right? You pick the, the one that the child has, and everybody sings to that one. But it's that that response that remains the same, and all the weights on me as the caller. Right? But you're still engaged in a two-part piece there. You see that? You hear that? Okay. So now let's do another example where the, where the response changes. What about, Mary had a baby. What's the response? Or you make, oh my Lord, or oh yes. I've heard lots of responses. Mary had a baby. Next, we have Austin. 
ostinati, plural of ostinato, right? So what is an ostinato? Short, repetitious motives or patterns that are thematically and musically related to a main melody. They create harmony when performed simultaneously with the main melody. Let's do this together. You've got that there. All right, let's sing Are You Sleeping, Brother John, together. <clears throat> Are you sleeping, are you sleeping, Brother John, Brother John? Morning bells are ringing, morning bells are ringing, ding, ding, dong, ding, ding, dong. Anybody have a suggestion for an ostinato that we could use with that song? Ding, dong, ding. There you go. Ding, dong, ding. That's your part, you're going ding, dong, ding, ding. Going, ding, dong, ding. Melody, all right, and then you get to the B section of the song and you learn another melody. 
that functions melodically. And then you get to the C section of the song, guess what happens? And they come together, right? But each one of those could be lifted out and sung by itself. That's the important thing. That's the cohesion part. Why is that important? Because we learn this way, orally speaking, our ears develop this way before, for the most part, before they do this way. Okay, so for us to be independent and confident in holding that part when, when, the, when the melody makes sense as a melody, we can be more confident in, in um, holding to that independent part. Does that make sense? Okay, so then when you bring those two melodies together, each one of them works separately just fine. They're cohesive, they're, in, they're, they're um, complete but then they also work together. And, and because it's a newly created work intended to do this, they're also gonna thematically work between these two different melodies, okay? You'll find that as you start to look for it, if you have not before, you'll find many, many, many compositions that are constructed that way now um, because we have found it to be a very useful tool for teaching children how to stand parts and, and giving them something that they can grab onto. All right, so look for partner songs. If you're with me tomorrow in the reading session, as I come across one, I'll toss that out to you and just say, look right here, this is what I was talking about. This is a partner song, and you can begin to see that structure if that's a new thing to you. So partner songs, questions about partner songs? Can you give an example now? <laughs> uh, Prepare the Way of the Lord, Michael Bedford. It's a great one. The other thing I love about Prepare the Way of the Lord is you can sing it at Advent, and then you can turn around and you can sing it on Palm Sunday in the same year, and it works really well. That's a great one. Let's try this. This is a silly song, but this will give you the idea of how, how partner songs work. As you catch on, you join me. One bottle pop, two bottle pop, three bottle pop, four bottle pop, five bottle pop, six bottle pop, seven bottle pop, pop. Try it again. One bottle pop, two bottle pop, three bottle pop, four bottle pop, five bottle pop, six bottle pop, seven bottle pop, pop. Feel pretty good about that? Okay, here's the next one. Don't throw your trash in my backyard, my backyard, my backyard. Don't throw your trash in my backyard, my backyard. So we'll try it. Don't throw your trash in my backyard, my backyard, my backyard. Don't throw your trash in my backyard, my backyard. So we'll two parts. This is the trash. Sorry. This is the bottom box. <laughs> Ready? One, two. You start. Here we go. One bottle pop, two bottle pop, three bottle pop, four bottle pop, five bottle pop, six bottle pop, seven bottle pop, pop. Don't play your trash in my backyard, my backyard, my backyard. Don't play your trash in my backyard, my backyard. Oh, last one. Fish and chips and vinegar, vinegar, vinegar. Fish and chips and vinegar, pepper, 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 salt. Try it. Fish and chips and vinegar, vinegar, vinegar. Fish and chips and vinegar, pepper, 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 salt. You're brilliant people, so we'll go for it. Let's make that line right here. Jennifer, you be in this group. And there we go. So we won't make you be trash. You know, you get to be the bitch. How about that? And this will be our trash right here in the middle. And no, 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 you need to be trash over here. You can be the bottom. Ready? One. One bottle pop, two bottle pop, three bottle pop, four bottle pop, five bottle pop, six bottle pop, seven bottle pop, pop. One bottle pop, two bottle pop, three bottle pop, four bottle pop, five bottle pop, six bottle pop, seven bottle pop, pop. One bottle pop, two bottle pop, three bottle pop, four bottle pop, five bottle pop, six bottle pop, seven bottle pop, pop. One bottle pop, two bottle pop, three bottle pop, four bottle pop, five bottle pop, six bottle pop, seven bottle pop, pop. nothing to do with each other, right? But you hear how those melodies layered together and created that harmony. Lots and lots of fun. All right. Usually when I'm doing this discussion, I spend the least time on canons because that's the one that musicians and, and trained musicians and people who have been singing for a while are the most familiar with. All right, but this is where I would put canons. Compositional form in which a main melody is imitated after a given amount of time. All right, canons and rounds are have technical differences. It's so technical, we're not going there. All right, but canons and rounds go right here. We think, oh, we'll just sing that in a round. It'll be easy. <laughs> have you tried it? Because <laughs> it's not, is it? It is not easy to 
hold your partner around, particularly if you have to follow somebody or if you get stuck in the middle. It's not an easy thing. So this is not the place to start. All these steps that we've talked to about up to now are the place to start. And then with the independence that comes particularly from being able to do the partner songs and being, being encased in that melody, you have a better chance of being able to, to slightly tune out what's happening around you, as well as be aware of what's happening around you, because that's a hard thing to do, isn't it? That, that balance between awareness and ignoring what's happening in the parts around you, but so that's what has to, has to occur for these canons to be able to hold together. So do them, for sure, but don't start here. A really great resource is Book of Church Songs and Spirituals. It's by John Pierre and Madeline Bridges. It's published by GIA. I will say everything else on the board is chorister skill except that GIA book. Um, but there's a wonderful section of canons in that book. There's also a wonderful section of call and response songs. There are action songs. There are spirituals. There are all kinds of things in that book. It's a really nice resource, but there's a good section of canons if you need some new ones. Another place that I look for canons is in, um, oh, what's it called? Um, it's the Red Helen Kemp book, and the name is Flood of Canon, Songs and Canon. Thank you. Songs and, Songs and, I mean, I just saw it. Canon, Songs and wow. something. It's red. Go ask, go ask Eve for the Red Helen <laughs> Kemp book, and she'll know what it is. Uh, but that's got some really nice old melodies in there as well that you can sing. A relatively independent line that is derived from a melody and intended to harmonize that main melody. Now be thinking about another word that we use for this. Don't say it out loud. Be thinking. A relatively independent line that is derived, that's important, from a melody and intended to harmonize that main melody. Can you think of an example of what a counter melody would be? Somebody said, a desk camp. That's exactly right. How many of you are sopranos? How many of you have had the experience, sopranos, of being the desk camp providers and you're spinning along and you think, wow, that just did not make any musical sense whatsoever? <laughs> have you had that experience? When you take out a desk camp, sometimes, they are written in such a way because their primary purpose is harmonizing the melody. Their primary purpose is not necessarily to flow melodically. All right? And so you get some really odd angular movement within the context of a desk camp sometimes that make them really quite tricky to sing, kind of difficult on the ear. So that's not necessarily the place to start for less experienced Singers. It's hard to hold on to. It's hard for experienced singers to hold on to sometimes when they're when they're really sort of out there. And what do I mean by intended to harmonize that main melody? Well, yes, there are melody, there are desk hints that you can move from hymn to hymn if the hymn tune's the same, right? But it's if the hymn tune's the same that it's going to make sense with the tune, right? So a desk hint is generally written for that particular melody. It's derived out of a main melody, and it's intended to be tied to that one melody. It's not something that you're going to leave humming as a separate song, generally speaking, right? But there are some that, that work a little bit more melodically, and that would be where I would start for children, is to just to look at the melodic movement and make sure that it makes sense to you as a musician. And if it does, then they're going to be the time. Now, all that to say, that does not mean children cannot sing angular intervals, because they can. But for the purposes of building independence, that's not the place to start. Challenge them with that later, absolutely, but don't start with a desk camp thinking, oh, that's going to be the thing to do to move us into two parts, because it's not necessarily. All right. How is, how is a counter melody different from a partner song? Can you articulate that difference? Yeah, exactly. That's exactly right. Remember that the independent, cohesive nature of the, the partner song was important in that definition. And for a, for a counter melody, it generally does not stand alone. It generally is very much tied in to that main melody. Okay. Two part songs. A main melody with a harmonic part that generally does not stand alone. How many of you have been here are altos? Or sing the alto part? How many of you have sung 
step down. And then you stay down and then you come back up to toes. And you can see it really well. You help me. And if you can't, you're going to catch on really fast. Here we go. I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river in my soul. I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river in my soul. You got it. So you as an individual singer are responsible for two pitches, right? Okay, so now let's go to the me line.
questions, any comments, any experiences that you have had that have worked really well? Any anthems that you would like to recommend to the group that would fall into one of these categories? Yes, sir. Um, I did one last year, I think it was Mark Burrow. Okay. He's a up and yeah. forward, um, I Can Do All Things. Yeah. It's got a call and response where one half of choir sings, the other half does the action. And then at the end of each chorus, you have one group that's sustaining a high note and one group at the bottom is moving between two different pitches. Excellent. Good. You know, sustaining that high note, that really is kind of a flip of a pedal point, right? Instead of being way down here, it's way up here and it creates those two parts. Um, but all they're responsible for is that one pitch. That's a nice way to start. It's kind of a counter melody-ish, I guess is where I would put that for, for in needing a title for it. But all they have is just the one pitch. That's really nice. Your Servant I Will Be by Mark Patterson does that with the refrain. It, the same concept. It just extends one pitch for a while. I think I saw a hand over here. Yes, ma'am. We just did an original um, musical this last week uh, at George Gagliardi, and it's called 24 Sandals. And this very moving song, um, it was Mary, it was, it was called, uh, she was talking about how, how she had lived life without him. And then four of the disciples sang their own little melody. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is going to be so hard. And But the kids got it, and so how he arranged it, he had a violin playing with Mary, and then we had the oboe stop on the synthesizer playing with the disciples. And I thought, well, that really helped having those kind of helping along Good. now that the different timbres. Yeah. Uh, but it was a it was a difficult thing, but they pulled it off. Yeah. That yeah. makes me think of something. Never say to children, "This is hard. I don't know <laughs> if we can do this or not." Well, guess what? They can do anything we can teach them how to yeah. do. Okay, so this, and what is difficult and what is not, and being prepared, this is all about teaching sequence. This is not what I say to children. What you're not ready for, don't say that. It's just we unroll it in this order. And sometimes jump ahead on purpose and go, oh, yeah, all right, they weren't ready. And we come back. You know, that's okay. Those are learning experiences, but just make, you know, I think it bears saying, I don't tell the children that. It's just that is my information as I'm planning that teaching process. I was just going to say that a lot of the growing and grace materials are written this way. Good. So that you can have the part one and the part two are the ostinatos and, and instrument parts. So, yeah, that is a brilliantly written curriculum. Uh, another great um, sort of call and tempo song is Mark Patterson's The Sea Line of Mind. Is it organized that way? I haven't looked at that in a long time. Yes. Okay, organize this call and response. Good. Mm -hmm. Very good. Ask it. Kind of going back to the two part yeah. songs, how do you teach that to the kids? Okay. What's your kind of method for how to introduce two parts? Everybody sings everything. That's the first thing. And I don't start with the melody. If it's a truly, truly independent two parts, I would not start with the melody for the most part. Maybe as an introduction, but then we would leave that alone and everybody would go to the harmony and we would all learn to sing the harmony. Um, and then they would sing the harmony as a collective group, the whole group, and I would add the melody. And when that's going pretty well, so we've got two groups happening in the room, even though you are joined as one group and I am a separate group, once that's going pretty well, then I would do kind of the same thing we just did with, with One Bottle Pop, and I would start drawing people to my part. And it might be that I just say, <coughs> oh, help me sing, and it might just be one person because you need to continue working on the harmony. Or maybe you're getting it pretty fast and I can say, I have you five, you come up here and sing with me, that kind of thing. So I take it from one group and one group, so two separate groups, to me handing over the part to somebody else. So I recruit singers in and then I say, you know what, you sing that, I'm just gonna listen. And I start stepping back and this group that I've recruited then takes over that melody part. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And I would do that even like, um, do you know your shepherd's voice? When it's just back to that echo, that's exactly the same process that I use. So I sing, are you listening? Are you listening? And you echo me as one full group. And then I say, okay, now this side of the room, now that's pretty basic, so I would do a big group immediately. You, you sing with me, all right? Are you listening? Are you listening? And then I start stepping out and moving myself back and say, I'm just going to listen and let, let them sing. Same process. It's a good question.
how do you decide which ones are going to sing the higher and which are going to sing Everybody sings everything. So this time it'll this time it'll be this group sings the higher part, and this time it'll be the, the, this group that sings the higher part. Really well written children's music, both parts do this. So there's no higher or lower. There's no fourth grade soprano. There's no fourth grade alto. Actually, there is a fourth grade soprano because they're all sopranos. There's no fourth grade alto, right? But uh, you know for sure that once they've been labeled, then that's what they are for the rest of their natural lives. So I try not to use those, those words very often. That's a great question. And even in my older choir, my community choir, where they are labeled that way, quote unquote labeled, we mix it up so that they're singing something different for that purpose. Because they all have that full range and they need to use that full range. Good question. Any other questions? When you put the three songs together, the third one I wasn't familiar with. What was that? About the um, fish? Fish and chips and vinegar, pepper, 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 salt. I've never seen those three things separately. I've only ever seen them all three together. And you'll notice there was a few variations in melody. You know, they're just a little different. So fish and chips and vinegar, pepper, 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 salt. I think it's in the mark looking ship, little yellow. It's in the mark. It is the same together, John. You're right. It is. It's in the same together, children, the Madeline Bridges. I was trying to picture it on the page. I couldn't think where I've seen it most recently written down. My original is a, a Xerox, literally a Xerox. So it's been around a while. These are great questions. These are great comments and wonderful input. Thank you so much. Anything else for the good of the whole? Yes. Well, just, uh, my group is pretty wide ranging in age. Okay. Um, where this year, the core of my group is going to be like fourth and fifth graders with a few first and second graders come in. Can you speak okay. a little bit to how to, uh, my experience has been that the, the stronger singers lead the, the younger singers, um, but can you speak a little bit to your experience in that? It, that it's hard. That's the first thing is that I feel your pain because I've been there and it's a really, it's a difficult thing to, to um, differentiate. With that said, what I would do is keep the youngest ones on the main melody. So whoever it is that's singing the melody, put them close to the youngest children and let them maintain that melody. Um, but also let the youngest children, when I have an age span like that, I don't always teach for mastery for everybody, mm -hmm. um, which means that I let those younger children have experiences maybe further down. On this particular topic, we might try something further down the continuum when I know they're not really ready for that, but I don't wait for them to get it perfect. Mm -hmm. Now, the caveat with that is if you've got that child that gets really uptight when something's not perfect, you gotta be ready for that. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's kind of the counter to that. But, you know, so we might do that and then we'll swing way back down and do something in unison again and kind of bring everybody along and then swing way back down, you know, so you're kind of constantly in flow there, but I would keep the youngest children singing that main melody or then, you know, trying some echoing back and forth, something like that but then let your older singers who, who need that challenge provide the harmony. So maybe they, maybe they collectively come out and learn the second part in a partner song. And so the majority of the group is singing one melody and just this smaller group of older children are singing the second part. So that number-wise they're not balanced, probably vocally they'll, they'll be fine. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, this time for the sources. Do you have any uh, West Side to West Side that can Ask me that one more time. Do I have, Do you have any uh, website about the children choir you recommend to us? Website. 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 Course. Course. Skill. course or skill website. Um, course, and it's course or skill. I'll write it up here just in case that's unfamiliar. Um, I'm thinking the Growing in Grace website, Teresa. Do you have a, Do you have what? materials available on the Growing in Grace website? Yes. I have not. There's some samples there, and I've got some in my room. Okay, so that will be another one. So I'm going to write both of those up here, and you can copy if they're unfamiliar. Mm -hmm. Forrester Steel and Growing in Grace. question. I had some of my fifth graders last year that loved desk camp parts. So uh -huh. whenever we would get to a song with the desk camp, they love to sing it, but they make up their own. Uh -huh. And they just sing something higher. And just, <laughs> it's like, oh, that means I can sing as high as I want and whatever uh -huh. I want. 
So then do you just back away and just figure they're not ready for it yet? Or well, that's kind of what <laughs> that's kind of what I ended I up doing. I wouldn't let them if they're seeing it and going, oh, I can sing whatever. Then I wouldn't let them look at it visually. And I somehow pull that melody out. And you can do that a variety of ways. You can put it on PowerPoint. You can put it on overhead. You can put it on a handout where it's just the main melody. Let them learn the main melody, and then maybe you teach them the desk kit by road, something like that. So they're matching you orally. And then I would have them look at it and say, and so now that they know it, they know how it sounds, then you look at it and show them, you know, this is how high that note goes, and this is that go, you know, whatever. Because yeah, then you, kids then you bring that visual back in. Ever since preschool. If it's, a, if it's them either truly creating something or them having some problems reading the visual line, if it's one of those two problems, that's what I would do. If it's something vocal or if it's an oral thing, mm -hmm. then it it's going to take some, some of this. Okay. You know, to match that pitch. Good. Thank you so much for your input. Thank you for hanging with me this hour, and I hope I'll see some of you again. Have a great evening.